Welcome to Five Star Weekly. Pack show today, talking PT's departure and the last known match of 2020 so far. All that and more coming up. Welcome to the show, Five Star Fam. I'm AJ and this is Mark. Before we get into it, become part of the notification squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button on YouTube. This segment is sponsored by Thinking Man Tavern, a cozy Decatur neighborhood pub. Grab a tasty beverage from a wide variety of selections and a plate of something delicious from the menu. To go, check out Thinking Man Tavern. Follow our Twitch for watch alongs on match days on twitch.tv slash ATLUTD fan TV. We'll rapidly get through two match reviews, some news, and your match preview for Saturday. So let's get it. So first up, it's the 1-1 draw against Orlando City at Exploria Stadium last Saturday. The uh, the lineup looked uh, something like Guzan between the sticks, Robinson, Wax, Bello, and Escobar in the back line. Sorry, that was a little jumbled. But uh, Rometty, Heinemann, and Lorenowitz started in midfield, and Lennon, Barco, and Torres up top. And for Orlando, it was Galice, Ruan, uh, Johnson, Carlos, and Miller, and then Roselle, Mueller, Mendez, Pereira, and Michelle and Daryl Dyke up top. But uh, yeah, essentially, you know, we uh, we looked pretty drab for a lot of this match. Definitely uh, a match that had many Five Strike fans worried for almost the entirety. And uh, it's a dramatic late winner by Adam John. Uh, or not winner, but equalizer, rather. And, uh, yeah, we essentially still are undefeated at Exploria Stadium. But, uh, you know, it definitely felt like a winner, I would say, for sure. Because, uh, you know, for us to come, uh, you know, come all the way there and pretty much look like we're losing for the entire match and we pull something out of it, we pull a point, it, it felt great. But, uh uh what, what were your uh you know initial thoughts after that match yeah i mean like i guess it's it's funny right because you were like gearing up for a loss and you're like here we go again i can't believe orlando's about to beat us again um and then so a draw does kind of feel like a win in that scenario i also think that that is to a degree an indictment you know what i mean of mm -hmm. um our expectations at this point i mean look the team's not good yeah, I don't think we can really beat the beat around the bush uh, when it comes to that. So it's a good result, obviously. You know, like the fact that we're still undefeated at uh, Exploria, that's awesome. Uh, we still have got that going for us, but that's really that's it. Like that's the bright spot, right? I mean, I'm happy for Adam John as well coming on and making impact. I think, I think he is like best used as a sub. You know, just like having um, being able to come on with. Uh, versus tired legs, you know, I think those runs are a little more effective. Those those leaps, as we saw, um, just seem a little more imposing. And so, um, yeah, and you appreciate the, I guess, the fight, you know, not uh, not giving in from the team. But uh, you also kind of get the sense that Orlando probably should have put this away earlier. So it's, uh, it's I think, mixed feelings overall. You know, you appreciate the results in the moment. Uh, I don't want to take away too much from that. But uh, obviously, like, it's still, I think, given the way the match played out, it's still a sign that, yeah, the team's got a long way to go. Right, exactly. And so, you know, um, it's kind of getting through the match. Um, it's, you know, the Lions, they they uh, they find the opener uh, at the stroke of halftime. And it's a corner, <laughs> corner kick that just deflects off of, uh, you know, one of their players. And uh, Benji Michelle puts it away, and it's just it's an exacerbation of our issues from set pieces. Uh, our defense against that has been pretty poor this season, and um, it's just another instance of this happening. But uh, you know, after the second half kicks off, we have a couple of opportunities, and Kubo Torres gets a wide open header. And he does not put it away. That's unfortunate. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, you know, their keeper does really well for a, a Heinemann uh, shot from distance as well. It's, 
it's one of those type of games where, you know, we just don't seem like we can find the back of the net. And, you know, getting through to the pretty much in stoppage time, Adam John, uh, he has come on in the second half. And Jake Mulraney pretty much gets just acres of space to be able to uh, to operate. Puts in a beautiful cross. It's, it's a, a cross that's on the money. And, uh, yeah, he was much maligned because of his uh, performance at MLS's back tournament, but I think he shows uh, kind of what he was brought here for uh, is that crossing ability, that one-on-one -on -one ability, um, you know, that he showed more glimpses of earlier in the season. And this one, he puts it just on a plate for Adam John to really have a booming header right into the, the far post. And it's, uh, or, I mean, I guess it's near post in this one, but for him, it's far post. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's something that, like we just mentioned, uh, you know, if it's something that we want to do a lot, I really question because, you know, you don't want to, you know, go to your plan B all the time, every single match. It kind of starts to remind you of uh, maybe Jose Mourinho in Man United when uh, <laughs> they pretty much ran out of ideas very quickly and they just started pumping it in there but um and you just bring on the big bodies put in and, uh, in. yeah put in Fellaini and just yep put him uh let him elbow everybody and uh no but it's <laughs> essentially uh yeah that's essentially what um you know adam john was you know i think meant to do uh for us as well is to be that great plan b option but uh, I don't think you want to go to plan B too often. You don't want to be essentially chasing a goal every single match. That's just, you know, um, I think if you bring Adam John in, uh, hopefully it's more to just be, you know, also if we're up and, you know, he can head away those uh, from the other team because they're trying to pump in the balls. So, right. you know, it's, uh, it's one of those, I think, that... Um, you know, it's great to see, but hopefully we don't see too much of that because that usually kind of pairs with um, us having to chase a game. But um, right. you know, let's get into uh, some of the some of the notes from this match. Uh, Jeff Lorenowitz played his 426th MLS regular season match, That's second all time by a field player in MLS history behind Kyle Beckerman. With uh, he's got 490, so still a ways away to go, but uh, yeah, it was of course John's first goal for the club, and it was the first assist for Mulraney and the pre assist for Anton Walks in that. Uh, I would say positive, maybe also a negative. Uh, Ezekiel Barco won six fouls, led all the players uh, in that, but uh, that's what's been annoying, you know. He's been a player that's been fouled incessantly, and whether you know the other player that uh, commits those fouls actually gets the card or not, rightfully, that's been a different case, as we will mention in the Miami game for sure. But uh, yep, <laughs> yep. But uh, let's get to uh, the negatives of this. Uh, yeah, of course, it was. Uh, I think the biggest one is Franco Escobar receiving his fifth yellow card of the season already. Uh, and that's in 10 games, I think, essentially. And uh, he will be suspended, or was suspended for uh, the, the next match. And um, yeah, I mean, he had just come back from being suspended from a retroactive, essentially, red card uh, for his actions against Nashville. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just very maddening, very annoying. Uh, or was it Miami? Uh, oh, well, anyway. But um Either way, it was uh, in, in terms of uh, post-match quotes, they said that, uh, you know, the importance of this, uh, you know, maybe initially felt like it could have been a, a good bump. Uh, they, uh, they said that it's important that the lads uh, out there, you know, they deserve the game. You saw real resolve in there and determination to not get beat. Uh, he went on to say, in terms of importance, we know how important it is to come here and not get beat as a first. We want to come here and win, so we are not over the moon. We know there is more to be done, especially in the top half of the pitch. We could have slightly been better, looked after the ball better. I think you saw that late in the match. We were trusting it and really pushing it, and we created some great opportunities. And, uh, of course, Adam John, uh, when he scored, there were... 
you know, fans in the crowd, and he gave them the shush. And he said, quote, I felt like I owed the Atlanta faithful one, so I was happy to do it against a big rival. Now, whether they're considered a big rival or not, that's a whole other <laughs> issue. But, uh, yeah, he did, of course, famously shush us with Columbus crew when he scored against us, uh, you know, the penalty and, uh, you know, in, in the penalty shootout. And so, uh, yeah. I think a lot of people were very happy to see that for sure, but it's uh, you know, I think next time it hopefully does score again, uh, and it's maybe against uh, Orlando again. Uh, you know, he can really do it in front of a bigger crowd. That would be amazing. But uh, but yeah. after the match, I think this was my favorite thing to come from the match for sure. Was that Joseph Martinez recreated his Orlando laugh. And uh, yeah, he, on Snapchat, he gave another Orlando laugh, uh, all for the you know, all for the fans for sure. I mean, we all got I think a lot of enjoyment out of it. We know it's not a win. We know it's you know, we're just uh, really in a, a kind of dire time right now. But you know, you take the small victories while you're down a little bit, and you know, it's kind of a sign of the times, unfortunately. But uh, you know, it is what it is. But uh, so let's move on to the match review for, uh, yeah, the 2-1 loss against Inter-Miami at Inter-Miami CF Stadium in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, uh, so that happened last night. We're recording on a Thursday night, full transparency. Uh, Guzan between the six, Bello, Robinson walks, Lennon. Uh, Lennon, of course, started ahead of Escobar because he was suspended. Uh, Rometty, Heinemann, and uh, yeah, Gallagher, Barco, and Jurgen Dom. It was looked more like a 4-2-3-1, really. And then Kubo Torres up top. Uh, I think, you know, the surprise obviously was Gallagher starting, and it looked like he was on the left wing. And you, of course, had the first start for Jurgen Dom as well. Uh, for Inter Miami, we won't go through all their players, but LGP started. Uh, you also had Breck Shea again. And, uh, yeah, Blaze Matui did not start. But, uh, you know, this uh, this match, it was, uh, it was I think, it, you know, as you say, as, as most people would say, if it, from a, a neutral standpoint early on, uh, it would have been good for the neutral maybe because it was pretty back and forth. Yeah. Uh, defense maybe optional. And, uh, you know, for LA United, it, <clears throat> yeah. It was it was uh, better. It was a, a step up in uh, at least the middle third. Uh, we looked a lot better, I think, trying to build up into the final third than previous matches. But I think it's uh, you know, ultimately when you have that as a result, two one, you know, it doesn't look great. Obviously, especially losing to the uh, the last place team at the time in the Eastern right. Conference. But what what were your initial thoughts after that match, Mark? Um, we were just I mean we tried to be open. Um, I guess you know what I mean. The match itself itself was certainly open. You know I think yeah it would have been entertaining for I mean it was it was entertaining but yeah I mean we were just played through so easily and we still you know I I still feel like even even with the uh, I guess slightly higher tempo and more openness we still weren't creating enough chances for my liking um and so i think yeah that's that's, that's really my biggest takeaway you know it's just like it's 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 difficult to have you know i'm trying to be creative in saying that we're, we're not good right now but i think it's just <laughs> another example of that right i mean like yeah. we, i think they tried a different approach mm -hmm. yeah um seems like I, both teams really did i mean you know, yeah. from the nil-nil draw, I think they realized this is not entertaining. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> right. Hey, right, exactly, yeah, because there was that really drab match that they played, what was it, last week or two weeks ago? Last week, yeah. Last Wednesday. week, right. And so, yeah. yeah, so, you know, but, uh, and I mean, look, you know, the, I think Atlanta United also had some tough breaks. Um, yeah. I think there was a question about whether Robles came off his line a second time, because they had to retake the, the penalty. penalty. That's why they yeah. retook the penalty the first time. And so uh, right. there's that. And apparently he um, didn't, but it was apparently Kubo okay. Torres that was encroaching. Uh, yes, yes, even though, yes. yeah, he was able to score that rebound on the first miss. Yeah. yeah, 
that call I have no problem with. It's yeah. it's pretty clear. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, I I think Figal's got to go off for that. I mean, like that's an elbow swing. He he identifies the you know his target and he takes a big swing. Like mm -hmm. that's a red all day. And this you know we'll talk about uh, pro referees coming out and um, correcting a mistake, but it's not corrected. Like the mistake stood. You know, and it affected a match that's now played, and this has happened again. I wouldn't be surprised if Pro Referees comes out and says something about that incident. Um, I think LGP should have been booked much sooner, you know, and so... But, um, yeah, I mean, it's just... We're not able to create enough. Uh, we don't... I, there's too many passes go backwards. I mean, there was a sequence at the end of the game, right? And we're, we're, we're down 2-1. We need to score. Miles Robinson plays a beautiful switch diagonal. Um, and it seemed like we had numbers, but then Arco brings it back and then passed a couple more times. And I think they ended up losing possession by uh, misplacing a pass out of bounds. And so it's just, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the roster just needs to be addressed. You know, I think that's probably our biggest issue at this point. Mm. That we, we, there, are, there are some good players here, obviously, but yeah. not enough. Yeah, well, I mean, one could say also, um, you know, w maybe with some proper coaching as well, because, yes, we do have an interim head coach. Uh, you know, maybe it could really help as well to uh, you know, shore up some of these mistakes and make us look a lot better. I mean, this is the, the thing in MLS. The margins are very, very tight with each team. And so, you know, every team can't be as deep as say like most european teams where they have two starting 11s it's uh you know you lose uh, essentially now two dps and now are relying on a 21 year old uh who hasn't really played a ton a, a ton of games uh it's pretty much yeah this is what you're going to get i think in mls like that's why the parity exists that's why you also see the likes of LAFC, they're struggling because their defensive line is very short as well now. And, uh, you know, they're very susceptible at the back. And, uh, you know, I think in this match, we're missing a, uh, a Mesa as well. I mean, for a few matches now, of course, but the back line is very, very young and also a makeshift back line. Mm -hmm. You know, having mm -hmm. Lennon as a right back, uh, <laughs> it's not first choice, obviously. Uh, walks is not first choice, but you know does a solid job. But I think in this match, I think you see okay. some of the fragility because of the inexperience being able to handle balls over the top, being able to you know handle the set piece defense. Um, you know I think mm -hmm. you know also you know Bello may uh, not always be positionally sound at the moment, but you know he's got that kind of recovery speed to be able to make up for it. But I think you know. You have that, you have pretty much the youngest side that we've ever had uh, in an 11 in our history in this uh, this match as well. I think that's what you get, you know? You have a mm. lot of inexperience around the pitch. And so, uh, yeah, I mean... That's an excellent point. Yeah. And, and so both of these uh, goals, I feel like, are uh, kind of ones that I think if we deal with them better, it looks like a lot different of a match. Uh, in terms of, you know, at least maybe the game state. Because, you know, at least if we can maybe be up 1-0 and them down a man because LGP, I think, with the same trip <laughs> with his left foot uh, or left leg, really, on Barco. Yeah, I think your point about any experience is actually a really good one. And I was going to talk about the goal, specifically the first one. Because, like, that is straight off of a corner. I mean, like, they yeah. headed out down the middle of the field and then they're three on three. Like that should, that's one of my pet peeves. Like I, I, I firmly believe that you should not get countered straight off a corner. Like that's, exactly. it's a dead ball situation. You should be like set up to deal with that scenario in case it plays out like that, right? Like the midfielder in position to uh, cut out the counter attack or whatever, but it just wasn't there. You know what I mean? So I thought- It's why Tata, just, yeah, played a lot of short corners because he did not want to concede that way because he knew. You know, he had kind of shorter defenders. Well, we, we have, you know, some height here for sure uh, to be able to, to handle it a little bit. But still, I mean, you know, you uh, you don't want to concede that way. And so, you know, the ability for us to win headers in the box maybe not be the strongest. So right. play a short corner. It's It might be frustrating to fans and whatnot because, you know, the chances to score might not be as high, really. 
but the chances for us to be countered are also lower as well. And so, you know, I think I think uh, still going with that tactic might be wise. I mean, that's just, uh, you know, some of the things that we learned from, uh, from Tata, maybe that's what we should do, you know? But, uh, but anyway, I mean, basically both of these goals, I mean, from the... The counter is just, it's almost one, one too easy a little bit. Um, you know, I think Guzan probably could have done a little bit better here. But uh, Heinemann, I think definitely, you know, the, the trailing runner essentially, he, he is out of the, out of that, uh, that play very early. And it's ridiculous. I mean, you know, he's jogging. He's essentially, I mean, I think... You know, we, we need to give them a little bit of a reprieve in the sense that, uh, yeah, these players are very jaded. They have played uh, every two days, essentially, uh, or three days if you count match day. It's very tough on their legs, for sure. But, you know, I think, you know, every single play, if you take a play off, this is what happens. You know, that's uh, really unforgivable unfor because, you know, that's, uh, that's what can make the, the difference between you know, three points or no points, but, um, yeah. and then, you know, just leaving, uh, Morgan kind of, you know, just free and open in the box. You know, he had like one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000 alone in the box before <laughs> anybody even noticed him. And then it was only right. when the ball got to him that someone, you know, chased out and tried to mark him. And I, I think it was Robinson, but it was just like, what, what, <laughs> What are we doing? Like, there's just no communication, obviously, and I think that just comes with the experience. It's, you know, very yeah. annoying, but I think uh, it's the growing pains as well. And you, yeah. you know, you uh, topple that with uh, fatigue. You topple that with, um, you know, you topple that with the inexperience and the the poor play. I mean, it's just the recipe for disaster. So, I think uh, anyway. You have any uh, any other gripes? I think. Yeah, the you know the two uh, yellows that should have gone to LG LGP, the uh, you know the penalty that's you know may maybe let's talk about the penalty. I think that's that was a, a very huge sticking point, changed the game for sure because you know Barco uh, Barco and Kubo were arguing over who wanted to take it, and uh, you know who in your opinion, of course, with the benefit of hindsight, should have taken it. I mean, I can understand Barco taking it. You know what I mean? Like, he's taken uh, penalties in big situations. Um, he does do... He does somewhat ha somewhat have set-piece duty, so I can understand it. Um, the thing I was saying on the retake was don't, don't switch it to the other side. Like, he's going to expect you to go the other way, especially since you miss it the first time. Um, and I think... It was just a little predictable. The penalties themselves weren't good, especially the first one. I mean, like, they're pretty comfortable for the goalkeeper. Um, they're not in the corners enough, you know, and so it's just, yeah. It's, uh, it is what it is. I can understand Barco taking it, you know what I mean? Like, no offense to Kubo Torres, but Barco, I think, does have a little bit of a bigger profile. And like I said before, has taken uh, penalties in bigger situations, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's taking them at Copa Sudamericana's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in those ties, and uh, he's put them away. I mean, and so he's a guy that uh, isn't afraid of the big situation, and it, I probably, you know, it added some uh, some dollars to his price tag for us, certainly, I feel like. But um, it's just one of those things where, yeah, Barco, I think, still would have been the guy, I think, uh, you know, before this match. Uh and so it doesn't bother me that he took him, but yeah, maybe that second one is you just gotta be a little bit more clever. You gotta, you know, be able to to send the keeper the other way. But you know, I think Kubo and uh, and Barco kind of barking over it, and also Jurgen Dom earlier as well. Uh, they were <laughs> it's just uh, very strange. Obviously, I don't I don't know if Jurgen Dom, uh, you know, maybe aware of the situation there, but we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, you know, just I, two new guys, you know, trying to, you know, fight yeah. the uh, incumbent essentially over uh, taking penalties. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, that's, I think that's a good point as well. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a strange happenstance. Uh, and it's something that should have been, I think, probably discussed before the match. Um, but yeah. that's the thing when you have, 
you know, the captain as the goalkeeper. That's the difficulty there. And, you know, sometimes you have the captain yes. as the person that takes the penalties. Um, not not the case here. You don't have, like, a Sergio Ramos uh, defender who uh, loves to take penalties or something like that. It's pretty much, right. yeah, it's, it's left up to the players to maybe decide. And uh, it wasn't the best look, I think. But it is one of those things mm -hmm. where, um, yeah, let's hopefully get that settled before the match happens next time. So... We don't have a repeat of you kind mentioned. Of a, yeah, go ahead. No, yeah, you mentioned uh, Jurgen Dom there, um, and that actually reminds me of another kind of gripe that I had, and it was just body language in general it was not good. You know what I mean? A lot of dogging. There were a couple times where uh, Jurgen Dom was felt like he was open, wanted the ball, didn't get the ball, and like clearly pouted. You know, and it's like the game's still going on. Like we don't have time for you know, we don't have time to throw your hands up or whatever. And so it's just. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that ensuing play when he was pouting, I think, uh, yeah, they uh, they went and countered us, and I think that's when they scored the goal. Mm -hmm. I think maybe, but uh, I, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, the second goal, I think. But uh, mm -hmm. but either way, I mean, I think he was still bright when he got the ball, and because he was making a lot of runs that weren't really getting noticed, or he wasn't getting the ball there. Uh, maybe our players were dwelling on the ball a little bit, but uh, you know, Dom did get the, uh, I think. I think he got the assist for uh, yeah Eric Rometty's goal, which, I mean, I think it started off really great in terms of uh, you know that goal. Eric Rometty is driving at their defense. That's exactly what we want. You know, you you want that risk taking. You want that um, you know just being fearless. And you know he had them backpedaling. He uh, got in the right position there at the you know in the box. To put it away, and yeah, he it's a very Eric Rometty type goal. He bundles it home a little bit, essentially. But uh, yeah, he's pretty much on the ground as he like karate kicks it into the goal. It's pretty amazing. But yeah. still, you know, uh, ultimately at the end of the day, in the second half, I think we had four chances. Oh, this light keeps going out. Oh boy, I'm gonna. <laughs> oh man, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. All right, but anyway, We're gonna it's just some. Something we're gonna have to deal with today, but, <laughs> yep. but um, but yeah, essentially, yeah, I'll have to replace it after this uh, this episode, but um, but yeah, four chances that we created in the second half is extremely poor, and I think something yeah. uh, of the product of us getting fouled to death possibly as well, uh, you know, could have discouraged oh, okay. our players from maybe wanting to take the risk because it is that you know you. You try to, uh, you know, be a little incisive and you get fouled like crazy. You kind of are a little reticent to do that again. And that's maybe the instruction from Diego Alonso, their, uh, their manager, was to, to maybe do that. Was to maybe, you know, hey, just make them, uh, you know, submit. <laughs> and uh, it seemed like we definitely submitted in the second half. So... Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't put that beyond him. And I think also referencing that second half, I think Miami did this a little bit in the first half who too, but definitely in the second half, they uh, were, I mean, they were playing a little block, you know what I mean? Like usually had eight, sometimes nine players back. Um, and so I think that definitely made creating chances difficult. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, being physical was part of the approach. I mean, when you have a defender like LGP, you can also just do that, right? Um, and I think, yeah, Diego Alonso, is uh has that reputation of being like pragmatic when he needs to and so i think uh wasn't too surprising how inter approached the match but definitely made it difficult on on atlanta yeah for sure and uh you know looking into xg really quickly uh which is just expected goals we had a uh two xg uh, you know and big portion of that is Remedi's goal and the you know penalties that maybe we should have put away right. or just penalty rather but uh you know for them it's really not very high it's 0.84 and so you know they i think got the the better of the luck uh and we definitely yeah should have probably taken this match so it's uh it's very unfortunate it's it's uh one of those type of matches where uh, we definitely didn't play well enough to win ultimately, but we got pretty lucky with the penalty. And, um, you know, on a different day, maybe it would have been different. But 
Uh, let's get into the team notes and wrap this baby up. So, uh, yeah, John Gallagher, of course, made his first start. And, yeah, we didn't really get to speak about him very much. But uh, with Aberdeen, he played, like, a whole bunch of positions. He played at right wing back, at full back, in midfield, at striker. I mean, and then for us, you know, he's playing a position that he's not really not too used to at left wing. But I think he did. I think really well. I mean, uh, all things considered, when it's his first start and, you know, it's first start in MLS, only his third mm -hmm. appearance overall in MLS, uh, he seemed like a person that was wanting to make things happen, trying to create chances. And, uh, you know, a ball that was a little bit behind Kubo, I think, I think was his best cross. Uh, but definitely, if uh, Kubo was in the right spot, he could have put that away. I think he was bright. I think, uh, you know, and his work rate definitely, uh, you know, he was making it, making it happen, I feel like. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's someone that I would like to see come in again and, uh, you know, possibly get another sure. start and trying to try to build on that. But, um, yeah, it was the 100th appearance, MLS appearance for LA United for Brad Guzan. I think that's definitely a positive there. Uh, it was Eric Rometty's third goal for LA United, but the first in the regular season in MLS for him, actually. Uh, he had, The other one was the 2018 uh, MLS Cup playoffs against NYCFC, of course, when he uh, bundles at home and Shemetis. And then the U.S. Open Cup when he also Shemetis against Orlando City. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, getting into uh, the negatives, we've talked about this already. The referees, Robert Sabiga, yeah, just clown. But uh, <laughs> our set pieces... <laughs> And defending uh, was very poor. Uh, defending the counter, also very, very poor. Uh, Hyman's tracking back, of course. And it, something about the team unity just doesn't seem like it's quite there quite yet. But, uh, you know, I think hopefully that does uh, get better. But, um, yeah, there definitely is. Like uh, Tommy said in the fan cams, I agree with him. There's a lack of leadership on the pitch, and it, it's very much due to the uh, the ages of the players on the pitch. It's, you know, not a very experienced side. So, anyway, um, getting into the post-match quotes and, um, you know, what the, you know, the locker uh, room atmosphere is right now, according to Stephen Glass, he said, I think we were a little bit frustrated tonight. We realized we should have gotten more out of the game, but obviously you don't get any points tonight. So now the next game, Saturday night, uh, is Saturday night, and we need to turn our attention to that. The players need to recover quick. It's a demanding schedule for us. I think there is a sense of frustration, though. Anytime one of your players gets whacked in the face the way he did, you expect the opposing team's player to get sent off. Your manager takes the player off at halftime because he knows he should have been sent off, and he saves the referee from correcting his own mistake. To be honest, I don't think it's not even a mistake. That's the bigger concern. And uh, yeah, like we, we might see something uh, retroactively that would be hella annoying, but uh, maybe, yeah, it should probably be done. But uh, yeah, it's, it's also, you know, looking at um, kind of what glassy, I don't know if you could hear the, uh, the um, you know, the manager on the sidelines, he was pretty yeah. much, yeah, he was going in on the refs and it was kind of hilarious actually you know there were some of the words that he was said maybe not repeatable but uh <laughs> kind of hilarious just, uh yeah go ahead yeah because no because you can hear him yell yelling like in lot you know when it's happening live like that's yeah. an elbow he got elbowed in the face yeah. and then like for him to if this is true that the ref told him that it was not an elbow that's egregious like yeah I don't, you know, I don't know about. And the VAR even agreed. It's saw. just, yeah, like the VAR, like you have it on replay. How do you not see that it's an elbow? Like that's outrageous. Like dog, <laughs> pro referees, man, jeez, it's, it's a shambles. I know we talk sure. about them. <laughs> it's the shambles. Like I know we talk about them a lot. I don't like talking about the referees as much, but it has to be said. That is yeah. bad. Like, and that's a game changing call. Like, it is. It oh is. man. Uh, and that's why we mention it in this one, I think, because normally. When it's bad, it's just, okay, you know, it's, Standard. it is what it is. Like, you just <laughs> right. kind of try to deal with it. Hopefully, it, it levels out. But sometimes it doesn't. And that's where, you know, you just really have to say something. And that's that's tonight. Yeah. But 
But um, so <laughs> anyway, that's uh, that's pretty much that match. I think uh, for me, it's obviously you know something that um, might be somewhat of a low point in our season, losing to the uh, you know last place Eastern Conference team. Uh, now they're not obviously in that sense because they get the three points against us. But uh, you know, um, could it be better? Yes, obviously everything is up from here, but I think uh, could it be worse is what I meant. Yeah, I mean, there is, I think, some bright spots in our game. I think there's some things to build on. Um, you know, if we're more brave, if we're more courageous in attack, if we're trying to, um, you know, make things happen more and not be afraid of, uh, you know, the foul that might come, the or not, the not foul that's not going to get called, but at least the, you know, the physical damage you're going to take. I mean, you know, I think we have the ability to, uh, to right the ship, but anyway, so let's wrap a bow on that and let's get into the news. And yes, so PT Martinez, he has been officially transferred to Saudi Arabian side Al Nasser. Uh, it was an undisclosed transfer fee from, uh, at least officially from LA United. The reports have all been about 18 million. Uh, the, uh, the reports also say that it's for four years and he's apparently making around 5 million a year. So he was making around 900,000 with us. That's a more than 500% pay rise. So yeah, I would say that's a pretty good reason probably for him and his family to, uh, kind of make that move and uh, you know he definitely had a um, maybe a tenure that divided opinion I think uh, it is safe sure. to say for sure but um, mm -hmm. you know him netting us 18 million a profit of I think around 3 to 4 million apparently I think that's really good mm -hmm. business and uh, yeah I mean, we didn't really get to talk about it officially after it happened on, I believe, Monday. But, uh, right. you know, what's your, what's your, I think, maybe best moment that PT Martinez had at Atlanta United? Ooh, best? Um, gosh, didn't he... I think he scored in the Open Cup final, right? The second he did. goal? The header, yeah. yeah. Or not the yeah, header. Yeah, no, yeah, not the yeah, header. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, it was, no, uh, no, 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 it was the... Good. The uh, Justin Miram, uh, he dribbled and it was a kind of a cutback. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, PD came onto it, right? It was yeah. about 10, 12 yards out. He connected really it. well. That's yeah. probably, yeah, you know, that ends up being the game winning goal. So I think um, that's probably, I think, the high moment, his high moment. Um, also enjoyed him scoring versus Orlando last season. Um, I think that was his first goal for the club. Uh, it was. So. Mm hmm. No, I mean, listen, his goals were bangers, man. I mean, like, you could tell. I've, I said it before. Like, he's obviously a good player. You know what right. I mean? It's just didn't necessarily work out. And I, you know, I I have, I think you can debate as to why it didn't work out. You know, was he a fit for this league? Um, did Atlanta United get it wrong in the first place? And how they went about getting him and then hiring DeBoer? You know, that's. You could, I think we, you know, you could debate about that for days, but for sure, um, yeah, there's, yeah, I, there's I people agree. saying, uh, sorry to cut you off. There's people saying that, yeah, he was misused, that he uh, was, you know, not played properly by uh, Frank De Boer. I mean, so, you know, there's that side of the argument as well as I think uh, where he wasn't maybe always fully motivated. I think it's, you know, everyone's at fault here. I think, I mean for him not living up to his high price tag. I think, you know, yeah. it's safe to say. But, um, yeah, I think, you yeah. know, it, it's also one of those things where, uh, you know, he, I think, wasn't, you know, the out-and-out -out kind of number 10. He, you know, I think was maybe miscast because when you have a number on your back that's the 10, you expect, uh, mm -hmm. and especially when you replace uh, Miguel Miron, I mean, people expect you know players to fully replace their productions of uh, certain players, but every player is different, and so you know, right. uh, you know, like a Hosetu even, like he's wearing number nine, like he's not going to be playing as a false nine, he's not going to be you know a striker for us as well. Like people have the attachments to the numbers, to the you know, um, just kind of the classic 
what you're supposed to be doing on the pitch and it's just not always the case you, you can't put these astronomical expectations always um, and expect them to be doing every single little bit but for me yeah he was I think that type of forward type player that uh, probably should have been playing more on the left side and maybe uh, yeah as he was playing on the right side I think he was doing well as well but he's more of the guy when you get him into the box and he's relaxed I mean he can put it away with the best of them and um, right. yeah nab goal of the week every single time probably because it's just you know how hard he hits it most of the time but um, that's you know kind of just I think you know the the chances that uh, he creates it's kind of you know fewer and further between a little bit in that sense yeah. um, he's just not he's not that guy that you rely on to just be the you know ultimate creator and it's just uh, kind of not part of his game. But anyway, so Darren Eels, he talked about uh, this, uh, the move, and uh, he said it was a good opportunity despite the timing not being ideal as they like to do their deals at the end of the season. Uh, he said they will reinvest the money in the club and are searching for another designated player in this window, an attacking player. And he said, we're always looking to invest in younger talent. And this is an example where we took the South American player of the year and we move that player where it's a good move for him. And we get more than our money back on that deal. I don't want any of our fans to think this is something where we have the deal and sit tight. No, we're going to fill that DP slot this window. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we went over this a little bit last week, but I think it is still very relevant that, you know, he's going to re make that replacement and they are going to make that replacement in this window. And so, uh, you know, we need to hold them to that. We have the expectations now that they will be doing that. And so, you know, uh, ultimately, PT Martinez, seven goals, 11 assists, and about one and a half years at Atlanta United. I mean, maybe failed, uh, uh, you know, numbers wise and maybe uh, kind of aesthetic was in terms of how people uh, maybe enjoyed or not enjoyed watching him, but I mean, he net us 18 million at the end of the day. You take it, you reinvest it, you get the player that fits the team, and you know, let's rock and roll. You know, but yeah, I think I think that pretty much closes the book on the post Tata era. You know, it's kind of weird. Uh, there were a couple of trophies involved, you know, but uh, there was also some discord and. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, Frank DeBoer is gone, PD has gone, and, and now we just move forward until, you know, to the next group and see what kind of a uh, team we can build up now. Right. So, uh, let's move on to the penalty that should have happened. Uh, this is one that we alluded to. It was the Atlanta-Orlando match uh, with the kick to Brooke Lennon's, Brooks Lennon's head, rather, and uh, yeah, Pro referees have officially, uh, they ruled it in their YouTube video that it should have been called a penalty. They, uh, they, the organization that oversees MLS referees disagreed with the referees on the pitch. And unfortunately, I don't think there's anything retroactively you can do about it. So it's just like, oh, great, that's cool. Um, well, uh, you know, can we kind of get a promise that you guys won't do this again? And, or at least, you know, get some retroactive uh, kind of punishments for these referees for missing big calls and big moments in the game. Something. I mean, it's just highly frustrating, obviously. I think, Redder, yeah. I, I, I imagine there is a, some sort of rating system for referees or whatever, but yeah, that's, you, you've got to, there's got to be some disciplinary action or something, you know, maybe you're, you get a week off or something, you know what I mean? Because, gosh, I mean, like, again, when this happened at the time, like, he kicked through the ball and his foot remained elevated. It was not a natural kick. That seemed obvious. So like, how are these refs? How is the bar in particular who has multiple looks at this missing this? It's just incredibly frustrating. Right. Well, it's the, yeah, uh, the center referee pretty much ruled the VAR uh, and overruled oh, right. the, the VAR mm -hmm. and pretty much said like, yeah, right, right, right. you know, it's like, I, I don't, I don't think, uh, cause he got the ball. You know, I don't think it's a, you know, I don't think it's a penalty. And it's just, you know, right. we might have still lost or whichever, but still, you know, them, Orlando, having to suffer and, you know, uh, have any sort of, you know, setback, I think 
works in our favor. So it's just one of those things where, you know, we need to get every single advantage we can because it affects other matches as well. But anyway, uh, let's move on from that and say congratulations to technical director Carlos Bocanegra on making the National Soccer Hall of Fame. That's very well deserved. I mean, yeah, U.S. men's national team legend, captain for 64 of the 110 appearances for the national team. And of course, you know, playing for Fulham, playing for, uh, you know, Chivas, playing just really, he's one of the most storied, uh, yeah, like men, U.S. men's national team players, um, you know, just played... I think, and represented the United States extremely, extremely well. And pretty yeah. much known as Captain I, America. Right. And I think uh, for maybe our viewers who are a little bit younger and don't understand the context of, like, Volkanegra and his career, like, you know how we're all excited now about these American youths getting their chances in Bundesliga and Premier League and so on. Like, Volkanegra was part of a wave of Americans who did that before. You know, like you mentioned, Fulham and um other other travels well wasn't he at rangers was he one of those he was at rangers as well. um mm -hmm. yeah you know and so i mean like that was a big deal at the time you know for an yes. american so mm -hmm. i always respected uh the american players who like took their chances overseas fought for their places and uh, represented well and i think he did and then he did at the national team level as well he played in multiple world cups so um yeah fully deserved i don't know if he should have been the only member of this 2020 class that's but, a sticking uh, point for a lot fully... of people but <laughs> that's uh that's like another show yeah. who won a multiple world cups right but well yeah 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 um but yeah no, yeah i i think uh fully deserved for boca I'm, I'm happy for him right uh they probably need to change up their their voting process but uh yeah either way congratulations to boca for sure um, but anyway, moving on to Joseph Martinez and the update for him. He is running on a treadmill now, putting his full weight, no anti-gravity treadmill. That is extremely good to see. Uh, this is essentially, I think he got his, uh, his operation done in March, I believe. And so it's what, uh, five or so months essentially. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's huge. That's, uh, maybe six months, I guess depending on uh, I mean you know obviously whether he's on schedule or not on schedule he's out for the season but it is still great to see Joseph Martinez rehabbing getting better making progress uh, he also is taking some aggression out uh, doing some uh, some boxing in uh, in the Atlanta United training grounds as well very uh, very interesting maybe people had some uh, some gripes about his form or whatever but I mean, man's just kind of you know, airing it out. I don't care. I don't. I don't so much care how he's doing it. So, um, but I think also though we have, I think, confirmed that he is boating on Lake Lanier, which is a little troubling. But I'm gonna knock on some wood and hope that absolutely nothing else happens to Jose Martinez in 2020. Because my God. That's uh. Oh my god. Hey. Right. Anyway, so. <laughs> Don't even think about it. <laughs> yep. Let's just leave it at that, and uh, let's get to the transfer rumor this week. And uh, Marcelino Moreno, he has reportedly been chosen to be the replacement for Piti Martinez. Uh, negotiations are apparently underway with the Argentinian club that he's at, Club Atlético Lanús. Uh, that's also Miguel Miron's club, uh, former club. And that's according to Cesar Merlo. And essentially, uh, Marcelino is a 25-year-old Argentine who can play in central midfield and on the wings. Uh, he's got six goals and 13 assists in 106 appearances in all competitions. And he seems to be, uh, to me, at, at least from what I've gathered uh, from you know just the research that I've been able to do, he's a playmaker who can beat you on the dribble, play the right pass and final ball, and has a strong work rate and has defensive contribution as well. Uh, now, goals might not be his thing, and he is 5'5", but he's a strong creator, and he's in his prime, and he's so he could be useful right now. Uh, because, you know, you have an Ezekiel Barco who's still trying to uh, put it all together, young, 
Um, you know, you have Joseph Martinez, who's uh, 27 in his prime, and he's going to be uh, coming back next year. So, you know, you bring another creator to, you know, really create the chances. I think, uh, you know, it would be maybe a pretty strong move in that sense. Uh, we have to realize, yes, six goals, 13 assists, and 106 appearances doesn't look exactly too sexy. I think that's like something goal contribution of like every five and a half games, there's a goal contribution. But uh, it's one of those things where Miguel Miron came to Atlanta United with four goals and four assists in his entire career. And I think he flourished. You know, it's one of those things where, um, you know, in different types of, uh, you know, systems and different, uh, you know, players around you, coaches, you can really, you know, change your entire career trajectory. And so as long as if they see that there's something in this uh, in terms of uh, his ability and, you know, how it might fit into kind of this team and, well, we don't have a head coach, but... You know, uh, that's a whole other argument. Should we have a head coach uh, before we make this designated player move? If it is, because he possibly, at least to in, at, uh, on transfer market, he could be uh, kind of at least worth 4.4 million on the transfer markets. But, um, you know, he is, he is on a free on 2021 in June. So, you know, does that kind of lower his price? Does that kind of uh, make him maybe a TAM player? If we can get him for much less than that and then maybe buy him down with TAM, then, you know, maybe this uh, looks even better. And he's not a DP. Brings us even more flexibility in our roster. But what, what's, your, uh, what's your initial take on this guy? So I want to uh, actually kind of piggyback a, a point that you made about the goals and assists because I completely agree. You know what I mean? Like, and even Almiron, who, yes, was more prolific with Atlanta, was still not necessarily always prolific. I mean, in 2018, he went, there was a three month stretch where he scored a brace against Orlando, and that was it, you know, in terms of goals. But, uh, you know, he did everything else. And so the way he's described here, you know, it can beat you on the dribble strong work rate sounds a lot like miggy and i've seen that comparison made but i also point out that yeah he's five five um you know the thing about Almiron that i think should be appreciated is that he was an incredible he, he is an incredible athlete like he's 5 11 you know pace for days um and of course you know the high work rate and uh at physical i think more physical than uh i think at times given credit for so, uh, you know, the compare, that's where I, I, I worry about the comparison, not to mention Miguel Amaron is playing in the Premier League. Like, that's a pretty basic mm -hmm. one. Like, even Petey Martinez is not in the Premier League and probably never will be. So, like, mm -hmm. you know, to, to say that somebody's going to come in and fill the boots of Amaron, you know, I would go ahead and temper that right away. But, uh, yeah, if, if, it's, if he ends up being, like, a long-term signing to where um, he stays with Atlanta United through most of his prime, I mean that's a, you know that might be a decent uh, decent move. I also think um, in terms of going after this player without having a, a coach in place, that's not always that's not that uncommon. You know, like clubs certainly have their scouting departments. You know, and then they identify players and they have their long term like sort of targets or whatever. But it does put pressure on them to get the coaching hire right. You know, and so I think uh, at least. This is a case where, you know, the player, like when Petey signed, Tata was in place and then the boy came in, right? So I don't know what Petey was necessarily uh, expecting, but at least now, um, if he does come, you know, he knows that, yes, it's an interim coach in place, you know, that the team is looking for a manager. And so it's, uh, I, I, you know, I guess we'll, we'll just have to see. I guess it's almost like trust the process. You know, I understand that... Uh, some people are not uh, necessarily believing in the front office right now, but I think for right now, I think it is kind of trust the process. Let's see how this plays out. Yeah, I mean, right now they they can get the, the benefit of the doubt from me uh, because, you know, the first three years it essentially has been, I think, uh, more or less still, you know, maybe Frank DeBoer aside, um, you know, we made the right moves to be able to win trophies. But... 
at the end of the day, did we betray our identity uh, in the third year? Possibly. Uh, and maybe it put us in, you know, the kind of current state that we're in. Yes. But, you know, if the front office cannot get us out of the situation, then yes, they absolutely should be held accountable. And, you know, maybe the, a change should be made. But as of right now, you know, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt, I feel like, and, you know, mm -hmm. see how it plays out because it is a 2020 COVID wrecked season anyway. And uh, you have Joseph right. out, you know, Frank DeBoer left. You have PT out as well. I mean, it's just there's uh, there's a lot of change in this season. So, um, right. you know, yeah. if we can get it together soon and hopefully rectify that within this season, you know, that'd be amazing as well. But because uh, there are still games to be played and, you know, a lot of moves to, to make as well still. Uh, but either Possibly way, though, season. I mean, like, I yeah. Think mm hmm. Yeah, no, so I mean, like, I know we want to still want to be in the postseason. I know we're not good right now, but like, it would be pretty disappointing if we just missed out on the postseason entirely. Right. I mean, there are 10 teams that can make it in the Eastern Conference. It's, it's pretty hard to miss the playoffs, essentially. You know, that's, right. uh, I don't know what the math is there, but it's pretty good that if you can be somewhat mediocre, you could still make the playoffs. But. Exactly. Anyway, uh, yeah, Cesar Merlo is uh, a journalist for TYC Sports. Sorry, just to circle back on that. Uh, but um, anyway, so, uh, you know, if we can get him, uh, if he is the player or not, we shall see. But, yeah, keep up with LA United Fan TV. We will be keeping it keep. Uh, keeping it on track for you and uh, yeah you'll know if he's coming or not but anyway uh, moving on from that uh, LA United announced that JJ Williams will be loaned to Birmingham Legion uh, for the remainder of the 2020 season essentially he's the, the club that he came from uh, but yeah the 22 year old of course was acquired in March and then yeah made one appearance got a red and uh, got one start for Atlanta United 2 and now is back with the USL side. I think, uh, you know, it's probably pretty obvious that we knew there wasn't really, I think, you know, a much of a future with him, with us. So right. at least this season. So, you know, loaning him back to the club that he was flourishing, that he's comfortable with, it's probably the right move. But uh, moving on from that... Uh, former LA United homegrown Patrick Okonkwo. He's caught on with the Chattanooga Red Wolves in USL League 1. Good luck to him. Uh, seemed like always a good dude and really, I think, supported us on social media uh, as often as he could. So definitely want to give him a shout out. But uh, yeah, moving on to LA United 2. Uh, they play Miami FC on Saturday. And yeah, good luck to them. Uh, but yeah, they've kind of pretty much been off for a little bit of time. So, you know, hopefully they can kick on as well and, uh, get a good result and maybe, uh, we can get some, uh, you know, no Mackie, no parties as well. If, uh, if you're keeping up with LA United 2, Mackie Jop is, uh, a guy who's been scoring at a really, really good rate. So it's unfortunate they're playing the same day as LA United, essentially it's, Kind of annoying. You just can't can't watch both games at the same time. Uh, but yeah, it yeah. is what it is. So anyway, uh, let's wrap up the news and get to a little bit of housekeeping. You can follow our Twitch for watch alongs on every match day. Stick around for fan cams afterwards as well. Lots of content all week. So head to twitch.tv slash ATLUTD fan TV or check the description below. And follow us today on there as well. So, anyway, so that pretty much does it for the news and gets us to our match preview. And yeah, it's Saturday, Nissan Stadium against Nashville SC. It's at 8:30 p.m. Shown locally on Fox Sports South and My TV 30 in Nashville. But. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be our third meeting against Nashville. We beat them the first two times, most recently with that 2-0 win at the Benz, of course. 
but in their last six, they have three draws, two losses, and only one win. We're not that much better in our last six. We have two wins, uh, two losses, and two draws. But yeah, we're going to be going to Music City Saturday, and they are... Yeah, Nashville, anyway, are coming off two consecutive draws against Orlando City and Inter-Miami. Uh, they have an unbeaten streak of three games. But, uh, yeah, we, of course, just lost to Inter-Miami on Wednesday. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, it's a team that, uh, when we face them, they've been pretty anemic up front. They've been uh, a pretty good defensive side, but... Uh, as we've shown, if you can, you know, find the spaces to attack them, you can find the back of the net. And so, uh, they're a team that can be beaten if you can, uh, you know, you know, create the uh, the opportunities. And that's something that we are struggling with. But hopefully, we can rectify that in this match. But um, but yeah, and so. In terms of uh, Inter Miami, or sorry, in terms of Nashville SC, anyway, they have some attacking help on the way, but it will not be coming in time enough for this match. But uh, the club has just signed forward Yonder Cadiz from Benfica on loan with an option to buy, and he will be added to the roster as a designated player. Uh, for us, yes, of course, we, uh, you know. Against Inter Miami, against uh, Orlando, you know, you get a mixed bag. You got uh, some good attacking play, and then we get the the loss. You get some pretty anemic play in terms of chance creation, and we get the draw. Um, you know, consistency is a thing for us at the moment. We, uh, ha you know, we have a lot going on. We have a lot of change, mm -hmm. but uh, sure. you know, in terms of their players to watch, uh, Randall Leal. From the wing has one goal. Hani Mukhtar has two assists. Um, yeah, I mean, he had that one assist uh, to, I believe, Jordan Zimmerman for their first goal in their history. So, you know, he is a guy that, uh, you know, has been able to, uh, you know, find some success against us. So we do need to keep an eye on him. Uh, for us, Ezekiel Barco pretty much has the keys to this offense. And so he uh, needs to be able to, uh, you know, to open up and you know find the the spaces for us to be able to break them down. Kubo Torres, I you know I think uh, up top is our guy in the you know short term of this season. He needs to be able to find the back of the net. Uh, Jurgen Dom uh, is another guy for Nashville fans that yeah I mean their left back he will be running at <laughs> at him uh, for a lot of the match and so you know it's one of those things where. Um, you know, Dom could be someone to watch as well. And at the back, yeah, Robinson and, and Wax, uh, you know, if Wax plays, they are the guys that uh, need to clean up a little bit uh, from that appearance at uh, Inter Miami. But uh, let's get into the injuries and avail unavailable players for Nashville. Ken Tribbett is out with a calf injury, he's a defender. And midfielder Jimmy Mandranda or Medranda is out with a hip injury. For us, of course, Joseph Fernando Mesa. He did make the 20 uh, against Miami, so he could possibly be available for selection uh, on Saturday. And Eric Lopez, of course, is not available until there is a roster spot opened up in his very, very unique case. But. Uh, <laughs> It's it's got to be maddening for him. I'm sure he's like, so I'm just here. I'm just gonna, I guess, train and not play yeah. for the foreseeable future. It's annoying future. for the fans too. Yeah, he's someone that could help, but yeah. we want to see him. Yeah, you know, it's just one of those. He's in limbo essentially. But um, anyway, let's move to the keys of the game. For me, I think it's the combinations between Barco, Hyman, and Hosetu. Uh, these are, I think. The guys that will be able to, uh, you know, move us up the pitch. And so that's very important for us to be able to, uh, yeah, see if they can at least, uh, you know, maybe uh, break down this team. And they have known, uh, been known to be a, uh, a deep-lying team. 
and maybe at home though and i believe they will be having some fans maybe they might come out a little bit more it might open up some spaces for us but we need to be incisive through the middle we need to run at and play combinations through the defensive lines and we shore up our set piece situations and dead ball situations because yeah that's clearly been an undoing for us lately and uh yeah if we can take some short corners so we can not be as susceptible to the counter as we have been as well. But anyway, let's get into the lineup for Nashville last match uh, against Inter Miami. They haven't played since Sunday. It was a 4-2-3-1. Uh, you had Willis in between the sticks, Lovitz, Romney, Zimmerman, Johnson, uh, Godoy, and McCarty uh, as the defensive midfielders, Moyle, Mukhtar, and Leal, and Baji up top. But last time out against us, it was Mukhtar and Baji up top in a 4-4-2 with Leal and Johnston uh, as the wide midfielders. And so, you know, whether they play a 4-4-2 or 4-2-3-1, we shall see. I imagine they will want to be a little bit more attacking. They will want to get that home win. I think we're probably ripe for the taking as well, in a sense. Right. So, you know, they might be going for it. But... Let's get to our predicted starting 11. Let's go through the lines together. So, Mark, go yes. ahead. Yeah, so between the six, Guzan, of course. Uh, so I think it's going to be a 4-3-3. Uh, my four is Lennon at right back, Miles, Walks, and Bellow at left back. And so I don't have Escobar in the lineup. He will be available for this match, but... I think, um, I don't know, I think he might need, like, a mental break. You know, I just think his decision-making lately has been exceptionally poor. And, you know, the, the I understand that, like, yes, he's a passionate player and he yells at the referees and stuff, but it's been a bit much lately. So, I, for me, I wouldn't start him, personally. Yeah, fair. Uh, for me, I think, um, yeah, Escobar starts. I think he needs to get the rhythm going and... Um, you know, if he's out, I mean, I mean, he's already been, uh, out of three of the last, uh, it will be six matches, uh, or five matches rather. Like, you know, if that mental break isn't doing him enough good, I mean, hopefully playing will, but, uh, yeah, Robinson walks and bellow for me as well. You could see Mesa uh, come in for walks and, or Robinson, maybe give one of them a breather, uh, cause yeah, every one of these players in the back do look a little jaded at times, but, uh, especially the center backs who haven't really had a rest. They've played every single match and yeah. while it's not an intensive in terms of position, uh, it's still, you know, you, you kind of, there's some complacency that will set in if, uh, you know, there's just not enough rest to be had, but, uh, let's get into the midfield for you. What do you have? So I have uh, Lerunowitz at uh, defensive midfield with Hosetu and Rometty. I know we've had, we saw the uh, Lerunowitz Rometty combo versus Inter Miami, and that was a pretty drab game. But uh, in that one, they had Hyman in the midfield. So I think, I think this midfield probably gives you a good combination of um, creativity, um, players who are comfortable on the ball, uh, but also solid. Yeah. Uh, for me, I mean, like, it's that, yeah, having having a team that's going to sit back, uh, just playing two more of the defensive midfielders uh, in the team just doesn't quite sit right with me, but it is one of those things where, um, you know, for me, man, Hyman really did not have a good match last match, and uh, for me, doesn't deserve the start, but he will be starting for me in the midfield. Uh, just because we do need, I think, more chance creation. We need somebody that can link it up a little bit more. And if you have, you know, for me, it's Rometty, Hosetu, and Heinemann. If Larry was in there for Heinemann, I think it's just a little too defensive. And we'll get kind of the same thing we saw against Miami. But, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, for both of us up top, it's the same. Dom. Torres, Barco. Um, yeah, I think going forward, that's probably the, uh, you know, who's going to be starting. And then I think Lennon deserves a rest here, um, even though I think he's been very solid, very solid in all of our matches. 
but uh, I think you know he might come on later. But uh, starting, I think you still give it to Dom, who uh, you know what paired up well with Remedy and was able to uh, get our lone goal against Miami. But any uh, reasoning for you yeah. with uh, that front three? Yeah, I you know I was critical of Dom, uh, but I do think that he I I like what I've seen. You know that burst of pace. Um, his centros are actually not bad. You know he gets the assist versus uh, Miami. So um, and then yeah, you know Barco. Look, he's our best player. I mean he has to play. You know it's uh, that's where you in theory um, you know our best moves are going to go through him. But uh, so hopefully he can like. It going that the in the build up to the, our goal versus Miami, he did really well. I mean, like that little right. pass with his left foot out to the wing, like mm -hmm. you know, that's that's like an example of what uh, we thought we were getting, right? In terms of like investing in Barco, so uh, and then yeah, I think Torres just got to start. You know, if John comes off the bench, does the job, you know, uh, makes it interesting at the end, like I've talked about before. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think this front three is is it for me right now. Right. Uh, so let's get into what we would like to see the two team do in this game. Uh, definitely finish our chances. Uh, the quick passing and decision making in the final third needs to happen, and uh, that's maybe a highlight on Barco there to make sure that he does uh, you know pass the ball when he needs to pass. And, uh, you know, maybe dwells on the ball when he needs to, when we need to keep possession, sure. But, uh, you know, when we really have uh, a lot of players in good positions, he needs to pass the ball. But also, I think we need to be more stout at the back. Everyone needs to track back. Uh, if we're, you know, jaded or not, it's one of those things where, I mean, it could really pretty much make the difference if we win or lose or draw. So, yeah. Uh, any anything that you like to see the team do the, do in this game? Yeah, I'd like to see the midfield just take control of the match. You know what I mean? Like I think that's uh, probably been our single big. I mean, like you know, there's obviously a lot of areas we need to address, but I think um, in terms of yeah, the defensive solidity and creating chances, I think both of that starts with the midfield. So um, I just think they need to those three players, whoever they are, uh, need to just impose themselves on the match and. Take control from the beginning. Yeah. So uh, let's get into the odds according to MLSsoccer.com. Uh, Lane United are at a 32.3% chance to win. A draw is at 23.3. And Nashville have a 44.4% chance to win. Uh, pretty much our last three matches, we've been not the favorites. So uh, with all that being said, let's get into our score prediction. So Mark, what do you have? Excuse me. I, th I see this playing out as a 1-1. One, one. Um, I just worry that the goals won't be there for us. I could see Nashville scoring off a set piece like they did the first time we went to Nissan Stadium. Um, yeah, it's just one of those things where I think it's going to be tight. I, I think we have a pretty good idea of how Nashville is going to play. And I think they, having seen us a couple of times, they probably know us, you know, fairly well. So... Yeah, I kind of see this playing out as a 1-1. One, one. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, it, it will, I think, be a little bit more open because they're playing in front of fans and they want to excite them. But I think at the end of the day, there still aren't a ton of goals. Uh, there's just, for me, I still struggle to see who uh, will be scoring the goals for either team, really. So I also have a 1-1 one, one draw as well. But... Guys, let us know in the comments below what your score prediction is. We're interested in seeing what you have to say. But that's pretty much the match preview and pretty much almost the entire show, except for the question of the day. And the question of the day is, which of our players on the team are you most hopeful can turn it around for us in terms of maybe individually as well as uh, kind of steer us into the right way in the win column that we want to be in but let us know in the comments below but guys that's it for us today remember to like share comment subscribe and for mark i'm aj thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video Let's go!